Hello and welcome to another episode of the Cliff Notes Podcast, where we ask a leader and find a way. I'm Tristan Bailey, and the host of uh, the show, and today I'm being joined by Joel Johnson. Uh, he's been working for the last 14 years for Smart Speed, um, his own business and consultancy, um, and he helps uh, other businesses improve their operations through lean and operations management. Uh, today, Joel's um, come to talk to me about managing the eight wastes that are holding back your teams and profit. Um, so where are you coming from today, Giles? You're up, up in the, the north, somewhere between Newcastle and Middlesbrough? Um, yeah, just outside of Newcastle, towards Whitley Bay, actually. So it's a beautiful sunny day. Is it n- nice nice weather, nice, nice outlook up there today? It's gorgeous, yeah. We tend to have a lot of rain up north, but uh, today is a fine, beautiful day. <laughs> great, great. Um, and uh, so what brought you on here was um, you're the author of the, the book, uh, You're Late, um so how how are we doing today are we were our businesses all late <laughs> um i think it's what's interesting is it's quite a few businesses that manage to be on time but they do it with blood sweat and tears so they they manage to get stuff delivered on time or the products and services delivered on time i should say but they do it at enormous cost they either cut the corners leading to crises down the line or they end up expending too much human energy to uh, to get the job done and so for me, it's all about trying to find the systems and processes that help them do it without the blood, sweat and tears. So I think generally people are better nowadays at delivering on time, but um, but at a cost. Great. And that's the area you focus on then is is sort of waste and efficiency, is that? Yeah, it, it comes in all kinds of shapes and forms. Um, most of my work is around looking at those operational systems to deliver on time. But as soon as you start peeling back the, the skin of it, you, you find out there's whole loads of um, inefficiencies and ineffective practices taking place within a business. And so that's where this um, this framework, the eight wastes, comes in to be really handy. Great. And I think that leads in nicely to, could you give us what, what are those wastes? What are we uh, leaving on the table? So the there used to be a traditional seven waste category system. And so I should say that the seven wastes They've been around for decades, but um, they're a bit like a game of I Spy. So if you've ever played the yellow car game where, you know, who who has a yellow car? But if you start looking for yellow cars, you start spotting yellow cars. So it's about being sensitive to, to what you're looking for. So the original seven wastes cover things like defects. That's doing things um, incorrectly or producing the right thing uh, in the wrong way. Overproduction, so too much of anything. Transportation, so that's about moving things around the business that... Don't add any value to the customer. The waste of waiting, which I think is one of the big ones, is all about delays in the process when you have to wait for decisions to be made or materials to arrive. The next one's the inventory. So that's either having too much or too little in terms of stock. And I should say about too little there because most people think having too much is the problem, but too little can actually stop a process just as much as the problems you get with having too much stock and have to maneuver around it. The, the next one is motions. So that's bending, twisting and wearing people out unnecessarily during the working day. And then the seventh one is inappropriate processing. So this is about having something in place in the business which isn't optimized. So not the best way of doing something. And so those seven wastes have been around for decades and uh, they're all great. But there's one missing which which turned about 20 years ago called untapped human potential, which is known as the eighth waste. And that's really the key to the whole thing, that if you don't get the the brains and the minds of the people around you all working, then you miss so much opportunity to improve around the business. And for me, you know, it doesn't cease to amaze me how many great ideas I fail to see. You know, I'd be sit, pretty smug sitting here thinking I'm quite a, a smart guy, but, you know, I see so many opportunities in businesses. But it's just a fraction of what other people see around them when they're working. And uh, that's really the important key to the, the eight wastes is to get that first one really dealt with the untapped human potential to engage with the team so that the volume of ideas and opportunities for improvement start to come forth. And that's really what starts to happen when I work with clients. They start with a problem like on-time delivery performance, whether they're achieving it or achieving it at a cost. And then it starts to unravel into all the other improvements that sit behind it, that their teams can see, and that we can start to implement that actually help solve a whole myriad of problems within the business, including the on-time delivery. 
Okay, so that sounds an interesting one. But before we tackle that one, maybe we can just set up uh, what what are these uh, wastes in in simple terms. You're working in 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 process and and manufacturing rather than sort of office based um, uh, improvement. Is that right? Well, no, it goes across all kinds of um, sectors. Um, you know, I've I've used these tools with doctor surgeries. I've used them with uh, the public sector, charities. Um, a lot of my work is in manufacturing and construction, that's for sure. But uh, these wastes are everywhere. I think it's about just being a little bit more creative with um, how you look for these wastes. And I think you're absolutely right. A lot, a lot of people think of the waste and they think of physical waste in the organisation. Immediately they're thinking of building sites and uh, manufacturing. I think, well, you know, an accountancy practice wouldn't have these wastes, but uh, if I give you a very quick example about an accountancy practice I did some work with, we were talking about how they um, streamlined their monthly cycle for dealing with their um, their clients' services. And when you started talking about what was taking place on a day-to-day basis, there was an awful lot of chasing and an awful lot of rehandling the same information just to try and get the end result. These are all wastes. These are all things in the process that the customer doesn't want to pay for that uh, doesn't actually help the the organization turn a profit and deliver its service. So these wastes are absolutely everywhere. And I think it's just a case of being open-minded about what kind of defects a company might have. So for example, if you go in manufacturing and you drill a hole in the wrong place, that's immediately a defect. That's what people think of. But how many times have you been to a meeting where an instruction's been given? It's either been slightly ambiguous or is being factually incorrect. And then someone's gone away and spent a whole day working on something uh, on a design, let's say, or a report, and they come back and the report's no good. And um, that's a defect. That's a waste of resources and um, a perfect example of the kind of things that are floating around our organizations, whether they're manufacturing or not. Okay. And on uh, on episode 32, we had uh, Peter came on and was talking about international standards um, for aerospace or ISO. And is that where this fits into, or is it more intrinsic to the business and, and just performance there? Well, no, it, it fits across the business and ISO systems are great ways to introduce these uh, into the business. In fact, most of the ISO systems all purport to have this plan, do, check, act cycle sitting behind it, which is the continuous improvement cycle. And um, so if we put this into context, so waste uh, are very much part of the lean movement, which is where you look at maximizing the, the value add your organization offers in terms of a percentage so that you minimize the amount of wasteful activity that takes place and, and waste is usually defined as the activities that your customer wouldn't pay for so if i link lean and waste together if you look at the iso standards and you've got the plan do check act cycle in the middle of it all the whole thing just meshes together so you might look at one of your processes as part of your iso 9001 quality management system and then start to identify where there's inefficiencies in that process. So that then ties in with a continual improvement aspect of these management systems. And so the whole thing can just mesh together. It, it's really, for me, um, a tool to help you spot opportunities for improvement within your organization. So they really tie in together well. And I find a lot of people who have these ISO management systems sometimes struggle with the continual improvement bit because they haven't got some tools to help them see their organization in a different way that allows them to define these improvements. So no, they go together really well. Great. And just to walk through that, I mean, where does the journey start? Here is, does the business have to believe they are a, a lean uh, operation before they can start working in this way? Or is it something that we could just start and, and investigate ourselves? Uh, to no, find I, where things I love that. I, I met a guy at a networking event uh, many years ago and he, he said to me, uh, lean, yeah, yeah, we've, we've finished that one. <laughs> I, I just love that because you know it, it, continual improvement there is there is no end but um uh, after a bit further probing with that gentleman they hadn't really started so no you don't have to see yourself as a lean organization in fact just um admitting that uh you, you're full of uh, real people in the real world and all its inefficiencies is a, is a great place to start the, the best place to start with waste is to what to carry out what they call a waste walk so I mentioned before about the yellow car game where you go looking for a very specific target. What you do with the waste walk is that you'd assemble a, a, a gang of uh, people from around the business, ideally from different parts of the business, and you would take a tour around your business, stopping off at key points, maybe a certain department or a function, 
and almost use the eight waste as a, a roll call and see what people see or are aware of in the organization in that area. And um, in fact, the other week, I, I, I ran a series of workshops hey for a if company. If you're enjoying we this podcast, had 10 sure different sessions around the, the business. electronic specifier and insights. we Their pretty much went through the same the places industry. on every single waste How tech is shaping and what staggered me was that the waste, the opportunity for improvement they've identified shows. were different. The latest I'd say in 70% of the electronics cases on every waste walk. That are, they're I, to be honest with you, I, I thought I'd be bored out of my head having the same waste walk 10 times, but I agreed to it and it's what the client needed. And you can find and them by searching every waste for walk was completely different. Specified the perspectives were different, the opportunities service, they spotted were different, by and going to what it meant was at the end of these 10 waste walks, we had an absolute huge stack of improvements to get our teeth into. Um, the key then becomes prioritisation of what you want to, to do first, of course. But... Um, it's a great tool to engage with your staff. It's a great way to quickly generate lots of improvement opportunity for your organization. And it's really, really simple as well. I mean, how hard is it to go to an area of business and say, you know, what defects get produced here? What delays do we face in this department? Where do we do too much work? It's It seems easy conversation starters. And if you get a good mix of people, people who are up for the conversation, it's it's really quick way to get lots of uh, improvement opportunities. Hi, right, just a quick note. If you're enjoying this podcast, make sure you check out the Electronic Specifier Insights. Their editors dig into the electronics industry, how tech is shaping our post-COVID-19 world, reviews from all the top electronics shows, and the latest tech electronics companies are releasing. Their latest episode focuses on automotive and the future of automotive. You can find them by searching for Electronic Specifier Insights on any streaming service or by going to their website electronicspecifier.com forward slash news forward slash podcast. I hope you go and check it out. So Giles, is, is this a bit like uh, uh, Gimba Walks? We we uh, like implementing these, but uh, and, and walking them, but th- they're more for for everyday practice and and things. Is this sort of an earlier discovery phase? So Gimba Walks are great, yeah, because obviously you go to the place of the work and find out what's going on. These um, are usually a, a standalone activity. You, you can introduce them if you wish to, but usually it's a walk around a business to look at specific opportunity for improvement. And it's usually a pump prime for any kind of general Kaizen activity. So during your, your Gemba walk, you might find opportunities for improvement just coming through the normal conversation about how you manage the processes. The waste walk is usually a way just to get a whole raft of improvements put forward by the business. So although it might follow the same path around the business, it's it's usually a, a standalone exercise that you would undertake. Great. And, I mean, what what's what's happening? I mean, what's what's sort of an example of what you do? I mean, is this like a uh, half? Uh, you're saying you'd you'd walk this maybe ten times. Is this sort of like a, a half? So hour the walk example I was given before about the ten walks that was ten for, different ten groups. What, Each walk was about an hour long. That you're needing to um, do here? And before that, we started off with some basics of you know what are the wastes that we're looking for, and then afterwards we actually then took the observations people had and then put them into an action plan. So in terms of waste walking generally. Um, you'd quite often have a walk just to try and get a, a deluge of opportunities just to sort of get your teeth into the, the process of change itself. And then from there, you might want to do that on a, on a semi-regular basis. So maybe if you're having lots of problems and uh, you have a very specific focus, then you might want to walk that process more regularly. But as a general improvement tool, the risk you run is if you do it too often, you have either you spot the same issue time and time again because you haven't got around to it. So it's demotivating or you have so many improvements, you don't know what to do with them. So I think it's very much a case of the the business regulating their own activity around the waste walk. So I'd say in short, if you haven't got some improvements to get your teeth into, go for a waste walk. And if you have got improvements, crack on with them. Okay, and then you just taking that information away and 
producing what actionable insight or do you have to then that's, work that's out a really how good question so these things usually or the things what you're looking for are the low hanging these fruit, improvements so is uh, i could probably split into three categories number one there's some really obvious low hanging fruit as you mentioned so just no brainers get them done uh, i'll give you a good example um at a business a few months ago, we were walking around. We decided to do a waste walk just to just to break the ice with the team as we started to get some improvements going. And there was a, a test bench. It was an electronics factory, and they got a series of test rigs on these shelves. And um, I'm not a very tall guy, but all these ladies seemed to be really quite short even compared to me. And for some reason, the engineers who designed these test rigs that were quite heavy, who were all, quote, big lads, had to put all the heavy test rigs on the top shelf where these ladies could barely reach them um, or reach them safely, I should say. And so it's very difficult. We had to go and find someone to get these rigs down. And um, it, it just slowed the whole process down. And it doesn't take much analysis to say, well, hang on, why don't you put the heavier ones lower down where it's safer to lift and put the lighter ones at the top? So we all looked at each other and went, well, that makes sense. So we just did it there. And then it took about 10 minutes just to move the rigs around so it was safe and uh more effective for the team to access them and to relabel it. So that was a a really simple, straightforward improvement. And a true Kaizen, you know, where you can do it there and then it costs you nothing and it's going to add a, an immediate impact to the team. So then you, you, so you probably get a raft of those. I'll go to the next thing. Then you probably get a whole lot of massive innovation type improvements where you think, wouldn't it be great if we threw out the computer system and got a new one, you know, and then you're looking at, a quarter of a million pounds spend on changing ERP system, which is not a small thing to change, which goes into the bin of, wow, that'd be nice one day. And then you probably have a good chunk in the middle, which is kind of gray, which is, I don't know why I've got this problem, but I've got a problem. And and those ones are great as well, because that's exactly what we need to get from Waste Walk. We need to get people to recognize those issues within the organization without having to worry too much about having to have a solution. And I think it's one of those, those things where lots of managers grumble about their staff bringing problems all the time and that phrase no don't bring me problems bring me solutions and a lot of time people don't have either the the knowledge or the 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 skill set or the tools to to come up with a a solution to some of these problems and and i'll come back to in a second but just raising those issues is is a great place to be because at least then you've got them on the table something to look at because how many times as a, as a manager or a director, someone walked around the organization and it looks fine. And what you don't see is the person struggling because you don't do their job and you don't understand some of the, the nuances, the intricacies of what they're doing. But they do. And they know it's a problem, but they just haven't put their hand up to tell you it's a problem. And if we can work out what the answer is to that problem, then we start to get a small efficiency gain. And we start getting that snowball of Kaizen where you know, one small improvement there and another small improvement here. Then they get confidence to start making bigger improvements and bigger suggestions. It, it really is the start of a conversation for most of it. So just to go back to those those middle ones, um, if people are offering issues, concerns, then it leads perfectly onto the concern cause countermeasure framework, which is a really simple way where you feed in all your concerns, so you capture them. That's the important bit. And that's where the waste walk really fits in. And then you can apply one of the root cause tools. Five Y is a great one for this, understanding what's really causing the issue that someone's facing. I appreciate that Five Y is a bit of an art form um, and people will happily bail out at the first plausible solution rather than get to the real root of the solution. But if you can persevere and, and, and develop that as a skill, then using the concern cause count measure makes it really simple to transform those wastes that are identified, quote, concerns, and then turn them into a really powerful action. And if you're doing a root cause, of course, the the countermeasure, the action to take is usually quite straightforward and quite simple. And that's a real sign of whether you got to the root cause because it's a bit of a no-brainer. But um, you can get a whole myriad of things coming out of Waste Walk. But um, I suppose it's everyone's fantasy that you end up with a whole load of low-hanging fruit you can just do there and then and none of the tricky stuff. But uh, that's the way that these things progress. You knock off the low-hanging fruit. You then deal with the stuff that needs a bit of thinking about And then later on, you probably get around to the innovation type projects um, as and when they're due for the organization. Indeed. So you get get a bit of crossover with the health and safety, a bit of uh, stuff that will, will will save some time or improve stuff. And then the other 
issues that that just going to take some, some absolutely work and that's, that's maybe that's one whole department change that's an easy that solution point. for them in fact you make, make an interesting it, point there about crossovers for them. Um, one of the really popular uh, to, to, uh, movements is the, is the 5s program for organizing the workplace and, and optimizing the the efficiency and effectiveness of the workplace and of course not just tidying it up which most people think it is um but when you've done a 5s implementation it can be a really good tool to use a really powerful tool to to use to follow up a waste walk um, in that area so you can actually see what you haven't mocked up already and one thing i've found um, with a lot of companies is, is that when they do the 5s they they might declutter the area they might make some minor changes to the working area and tidy it up um, i'm also really lucky if they've set standards and then sustain it but with the second s the the set in order it's amazing how many times people miss that opportunity to redesign the working area to make it more effective, more efficient as a as a, a place to do work. Um, so they might have tidier shelves and nice labeling, but actually their kits are in the wrong place. They're still going to walk back and forward far too much during a working day. They might find the tools are not organized to be as effective as possible. So they keep on reaching into that toolbox to find things rather than putting that shadow board in place that's organized in the most efficient way. So a waste walk after a 5S implementation can be really, really powerful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and no, was it uh, uh, just to follow on, and maybe it comes back to your your point earlier on with with getting people involved. Was I was at a seminar, and they they walked us through this demonstration of um, uh, some women who were put into a cell and given control over that, and they could move their piece around because they were given a right. We need many more pieces through this this section uh, an hour, and they were like, "Well, we can't do it. There's like there's a bottleneck here and a bottleneck there." we haven't got the power to rearrange the machines and stuff. So we went, well, go ahead. Here's, here's a couple of engineers who they, they'll give you uh, a few hours each day this week. But we, we, your challenge is for the next two months is to, to raise that. And by, by rearranging it, they didn't solve everything, but they did change a bottleneck that, that they were having. Um, and it was much more of an improvement just by giving them control and these tiny little issues, tiny little things that they could change. And then they could see improvement oh, to their it, day it, it's because it's their day example. of standing but there. I used to have a guy moving the called stuff Les worked for me many, um, many years so ago. So it, it makes them happier and, and more um, efficient. Pretty much the same situation. Uh, this, this is a shameful admission here. So I used to be an engineer at a, uh, a factory that made components of the power generation sector. And uh, I got involved with lots of tech transfer projects, moving technologies between countries. And I got the job of bringing a technology from, I believe it was Switzerland, across to the UK. And uh, I remember the equipment turning up late one night and we hastily shoved it into this uh, part of the factory we'd identified and then set up the production cell exactly the same way as it had been in Switzerland. And then we put a team leader in charge, this guy called Les, and uh, left the poor bugger in charge and just um, let him get on with it. So you roll on 18 months and I become his manager, uh, moved away from my engineering role into an operations management role. And um, I find out that this chap um, has the lucky title of being the seventh best supplier in our internal group structure. The problem was when he had seven companies, so it was actually the worst. And his previous manager had used that title with him every week to complain about the performance. He'd also pretty much quashed the guy's uh, enthusiasm and motivation. So this guy was just turning up to work, running a process that was ineffective and inefficient and not hitting his targets and being grumbled at by the other group companies. It took quite a long time to get through to to Les. Um, we had a very poor relationship at the start. And it's, it's like most of these lean things, lean approaches, you know, how the the people centric. If you don't get the people on board, going back to the eighth waste there, you're just missing a trick. I could have directed this guy. I could have um, given him a hard time, but I'd already put the gear in. I knew how it worked. It's just the day-to-day operations that I, I wasn't as familiar with, you know, how they actually had to carry out the job. So spent a bit of time with Les, still wasn't seeing the holy grail of the improvements. And um, we brought in a measurement system. We brought in OEE, um, overall equipment effectiveness. I don't know if you come across that one, but it's a it's a composite metric, great great to use, um, and gives you a bit of a clue where to start looking for the improvements yeah. in terms of the big six losses. Uh, we simplified it right down and said, you know, is it an availability of kit issue? Is it a performance issue in terms of how you can actually meet your cycle times, or is it a quality issue? Anyways, our OEE score, 
and, and for those who aren't aware of it, you know, 85% is deemed world class. We were running about six or seven percent, so it was pretty pretty dire. But it, it gave us something to talk about. We didn't know what we we're going to do with it, but something to talk about. So we started doing some waste activity in, in the department, and um, I gave Les the tools of a waste walk. Um, they wanted me out of the picture. They didn't want any management to be involved just because of the previous history with that department. And they started coming up with some small little improvements to nibble away, you know, nibble away at. And uh, there were marginal spends, a couple of hand tools here and there. Most of it was just their time rearranging things. And the score went from about 7% to the, the low teens. So not, it wasn't rocking the world, but it was a step in the right direction. But the big thing from that is that the guys in the team could see change actually happening. Rather than being ignored, they had a degree of control, just like your story with the, the cell and the bottleneck. They could start to make improvements. Now, the big thing was they didn't know how to make certain improvements. And, and this is where I think it's really empowering for teams is when the organization structures turned upside down and people there to support these teams rather than to follow some chain of command where people get pecked in a certain order. So I gave Les an engineer, just like your story, and I also gave him a materials manager. And during the course of their project, and it took a while to hand over because he was he was nervous and it was new to, to, to work in this way. In those meetings, he was the boss. Outside of that, normal you know hierarchy ensued. But during those meetings, he was a boss. He could ask for things. They agreed to it. He could hold them to account. And it took a while because it's you know it's, it's a bit different way of working for quite a few people. But over a few months, we went from being the worst performer with an OEE of about seven percent to the global number one and our OEE got into the the top 80s it was absolutely amazing transformation but the, the biggest one in there was that he came to my door one day and asked to drill some holes into an oven and I hadn't got a clue what he was talking about so he took me for a walk and he showed me an oven that I'd walked past probably for the last four years without paying much attention to hadn't even recognized it he told me it was working um, and told me that our main capacity problem would go away if we could drill two holes in it so I'm sort of standing there a bit gobsmacked trying to understand what on earth is going on about. So we checked the lining. There was no asbestos in the lining. It was safe to drill. He modified a, a small rig, some scrap material he effectively had in his department um, that he could modify um, with the help of the maintenance team. And 45 minutes later, he'd actually completely transformed our bottleneck, which was the handling the mix of product through the department. Um, we had three different product sizes and you could run two safely at any one time, but you put the third one in, it just crippled the performance of one of the um, the processes. And he solved that. And that was a problem that uh, he knew existed. And I'd walked past it for four years without having recognized as an opportunity. And this chap who had been written off by previous managers was just an absolute superstar. He'd been given the opportunity and some tools and some support and resource and he completely transformed that function. It was a absolutely cracking little uh, little story for those guys. In fact, we we uh, we made some awards because I think you've got to celebrate these things. And I'm personally not a fan of celebrating things in a financial reward because I think it drives the wrong behaviours. But um, I had a series of certificates we put around the business. And I don't know if you can recall the T file men. I think it was late '80s. These guys who were the research and development guys who had the massive foreheads with the big brains. Um, but we got a picture of Les and uh, stretched his head out to be like a T-file man and had this big certificate hanging over his uh, door on the way into the, the cell. <laughs> and uh, funnily enough, that became a sought after item to get one of my certificates. So uh, it really drove a lot of uh, great behavior in the organization. And in fact, the overall organization became the uh, number one global performer within the group uh, as an overall, not just his one function, because we just kept on going and going. It was uh, superb, absolutely superb. Oh, that sounds great. It's almost a bit like the story. I, mean, I don't know technically his background, but um, the was it uh, Tommy Flowers in the the uh, during the Second World War? Um, he was a he's a general post office manager, but he was the one who designed and built um, one of the first computers. Like so, uh, just being being able to have that opportunity and and sort of taking a chance and taking control of of the space. I know that's not quite the same situation, but it's that. But I think sometimes it's people point there, can, that uh, can achieve under play <laughs> totally within different your circumstances job. than they I mean, with uh, so many jobs are so uh, and, and, and screwed up. down in terms of the time, and I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm a chartered engineer, so I spend my time looking at cycle times and things. But there's a reality that 
if there's not a little bit of wiggle room in the working day to stop and think, um, you you miss so many opportunities. And, and something I always get confronted by with clients is you know, about how busy people are. Yeah, and people spend their, their lives telling me how busy they are. I mean, if you stand back, you could probably be quite picky about all the time. They waste. But I think it's getting through to people that these waste walks, you know, these these gamble walks, however you want to do it, if you get a little bit of time to identify a few opportunities for improvement and a little bit of time to nibble away at them, however small, you can make a huge dent. And it actually it's an investment going forward. Um, that, that actually factor I was talking about, that we transform the overall performance. When I took over the the helm of manufacturing, we were running at uh, a 20 week manufacturing lead time. So that's from cutting metal through to the full product development. I mean, there's tanking stages, quite a lot of work in there. But 20 weeks to go from cutting metal at the start to final test and dispatch was a huge amount of time because I say as an engineer, you look at it and you think, well, there's two and a half weeks of work content in there. So where on earth is the other 17 weeks? And we were delivering about 20% on time in full, which goes back to my on-time stuff at the start. But this is, you know, the company was quite happy saying, you know, we'll, there was 12 things on the order. We delivered nine, that's 75% on-time delivery. Well, you know what? The customer needed all 12 on that day. So that's a 0% when you look at OTIF. And when I, when I stepped back and looked at what was going on, my day was just spent running around, uh, effectively lying to customers about when they're going to get their products, um, watching teams just work inefficiently, running out of materials, having the wrong information at the, the wrong time, um, just everything stacked up. And then at the front end, the sales team just loading the factory and loading it and loading it and loading it. And you just know you're going to fail in all this work. And there was that realization at some point, I just stop, just stop with it because it makes no difference. I would take a day's holiday. It's still chaos. So if I'm there, not running around, it's still chaos. So why not just use that time and start working on the improvements and just, and either phase, you know, sod the day job because I'm having no impact. And I think it's tough for people to to realize that sometimes they can just get off the treadmill and even investing the right 10, 15 minutes on a daily basis can make huge inroads in terms of performance issues, um, whether that's quality or delivery or overall efficiency. It's stopping, taking a time out and doing, using your time productively in that, in that time out because it will pay back. The end of that story was, okay, we did transfer on the production. Um, we were, were turning over about 10, 10 million turnover at the time. And we got to 30 million turnover with no extra staff at a 98% plus on time and full rating on a three and a half week lead time. We just started sucking working from everywhere because the, uh, the we're in a global marketplace. Uh, we made bespoke product. And there's not that many people around the world who could do it. It's probably about eight or 10 people who could uh, compete with us. Uh, and, and likewise, um, but we made a name for ourselves. We delivered on time, reliably, and did it quickly. We just, but everyone was pulling together. We we got away from having um, sales teams who were randomly loading the factory. That was the biggest thing for me. It wasn't a big job in the end, but so out of the capacity management and the loading of the work in the factory, we put rules in place so people understood what they they were meant to do. We got away from having nine individual production schedules going through the business and went to one factory, one schedule. So a lot of these things come out that um, need to be changed. And a lot of them boil down to not very big changes. There were minor tweaks in the great schema thing. But if you don't take the time out to do these changes, that just never happen. And then you never save the time down the line. So I, d- I do think having a little bit of wiggle room in the day job, a little bit of time to play and experiment, to effectively fail and learn um, is, is is vital. In fact, the learning bit is, is absolutely critical. I mean, if you look at the eighth waste, it's great having these ideas and these um, observations from people. But if they don't have the experience and knowledge and confidence to put the change in place, you're still firing on only a handful of cylinders. You haven't got everything going the way it should be. And it's the learning that takes place that really makes that difference for me. So there's another framework called CARL, which it, it's very similar to the Plan, Do, Check, Act. So CARL stands for Challenge, Action, Results and Learning. And I keep saying to anyone I mentor is, OK, do the project, do the project in a way that you you know, you can learn from. But then reflect on your own self. What did you learn personally about the experience? And people tell me things like they've, they've understand how to speak to people differently to get different results. You know, they understand how to manage their time differently. They understand how to apply different um, 
um, problem solving tools to problems to get different results. And none of it is ever rocket science, but it's that their own personal journey they've got to take to discover these basic truths that make them more effective in the long run. And you can see the people who do learn from uh, their experiences because they start taking bigger and bigger projects, doing things faster, more effectively. And there's other people who just don't, and they do the same old thing time and time again after you poke them with a stick to get any kind of results at all. So the whole issue of learning and becoming more productive ties in with having the time to play. So time to play, time to learn, time to get better, time to improve. You save some time your day job, and that cycle then just repeats and repeats. And as you can say, it sounds like the plan do check out cycle all over again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and no, I've, I've I've experienced that too. Is in in the sense there is, and see, I think that's what you're saying. If, if hear me right, there isn't really a ceiling to to success, um, but there are certain learnings you can have with failure, and people have got to be allowed to to find those I walls think and find those lovely, decisions yeah, that, not to great. take, so that you can keep going in the direction that are yeah. successful. So, I mean, I I had that worked on um, it's like uh, flower bulb. Um, farm and uh, also uh, mustard factory within within condiments and stuff uh, and just spending that time running and tweaking the the, the line um, but being the, the the floor manager at the, at the time so you have to more on the people and keep going keep going can't stop the line <laughs> we've got to work through the night to, to get this stuff um, but that moment when you could step back or, or realizing okay this person's been here for a few years if I give them an hour off that they've had their lunch but if i give them an hour off in the afternoon to step back and tell me these improvements because they've had all day for, for many days standing there thinking i get this 10 percent a day that goes through wrong or or the, the labels around the wrong way or there's something else wrong or uh, the heat treatment's not working properly they, they've seen when it's worked and when it hasn't um, and if they're given the time to stand back they often can just find those little solutions and it improves because it's improving their day, but it's also improving the X times the number of things that are going through the line uh, for the rest of the team. So, um, yeah, d- definitely, definitely see that. Oh, completely. Yeah, that, that story, that benefit runs on and runs on for the future forevermore. Mm-hmm. So that hour you've spent or, or, quote, wasted, as one manager told me, it was a waste of time giving these people uh, time off. I think it's one of the old school who thought that people weren't paid to think, which is the most shocking thing you can ever hear in the world. But um, yeah, uh, but that hour invested and sometimes that hour won't go right. You know, you might need a few of these hours to, to perfect these ideas, but if you do it, you start to save that hour, two hours, five hours every week without doing anything different going forwards. So then you can invest a little, another hour next week on something else. And you say, you know, eventually that's how we got to three times a turnover with our extra staff is because we got good at what we're doing by having those kind of conversations. And I think a lot of managers, they feel a little embarrassed about having these conversations because they feel that they should know the answers and they should be better than the people they are reporting to them. And I think when people get past that ego and can ask those quote thick questions, you can get a lot of good things happening. And especially people, a lot of people want to make their day better one, so life easier, but two, a lot of people find it very interesting and um, rewarding to make something better. Yeah. 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 Um, I get that. You know, and why wouldn't you want to do that? So it's, it's, but it's, it's a tough challenge for a lot of people. In fact, I, there was a team um, at one company I was involved with, and they had a team, um, a production team, but within there, a team of apprentices. And I think there's about eight guys in there, probably between 16 years old and 25, all doing apprenticeships in welding. And uh, we had a, a production cell we wanted to put in place. And their previous production was disjointed. There was a lot of uh, moving product back and forward. And it also caused huge disruption to the rest of the business when they got an emergency order come through into their order books, which they had about 40% of the time. So every couple of hours, there'd be an emergency. And the previous way of working was to disrupt everything. Um, I mean, literally everything. The supply chain was disrupted. The current production was disrupted. The teams were disrupted in the support staff as well as production staff. And when you did the analysis, you could say, well, 85% of your disruptions are caused by one product. So let's make a sell for that one product to handle things differently. And before the apprentices got involved, I found the managers, they refused to give me a plan of what they wanted to do. And um, they they were caught one day. I, I walked down the shop floor and they were just driving around with forklift trucks, moving things back and forward and trying to reproduce what didn't work in a different area of the factory. 
So I said, look, I'd really like the opportunity to give the, the apprentices a, a bite at this thing. It's great learning and I'd like to see what they could do. And the manager said, you're going to waste your time. There was no nothing kids. Anyways, those no nothing kids with a, a little bit of uh, direction and a few tools produced a production cell that's eight times more productive than the previous setup. So I, I like rooting for the underdog and the uh, quote, no nothing kids who can actually change the uh, production completely. I mean, that place won awards off the back of that production because it was so fast at turning around product, especially in emergency situations. So, um, yeah, I, I still find it frustrating. I still find it an ongoing challenge that managers don't feel the need to engage and stuff. Or you having a conversation. I mean, if you go back to the TV program Columbo, you know, the detective who asked, quote, thick questions and just kept on asking the dumb questions until he got the answer. I wish people would be a bit more like that at times and be willing just to know it's a thick question and just embrace the answer without worrying about what the team think about them. Because if you keep doing it, you will hit that little nugget eventually. It makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, exactly. I have a friend who works in, in software and uh, her, her favourite show is Columbo and rewatching it, rewatching it. So she's always coming out. With, uh, <laughs> I love his um, style. Uh, yeah, I remember I was watching it as a kid. Uh, but um, yeah, just, just to bring that back, I mean, we've been talking about about people working on the on the line and, and empowering people. Where, where is it that it comes in for the managers and, and for the for the business owners? I mean, have you got ways of setting up um, criteria or, or uh, definitions of success before you start? Or I mean, how do you evaluate that you don't just jump into a, a massive list of why is everyone working on this list of tasks instead of producing uh, product? Sure. Yeah, I think the the job of the directors and the, the senior managers is to create the environment where it's okay to have this time, and uh, to to come up with some way of safely failing. So I think that's where they they need to come into this this um, part of the conversation. I think if they can get involved with the different levels of the organisation and show a bit of face, well, it goes a long way. Especially if they're shown to be learning, um, because it, it affects all levels. The amount of time boards have looked at this and said yeah great it's great for them but it's not for us uh in fact going back to your iso comments before all the all iso standards d dictate that leadership must be involved with these systems because it isn't just for those guys in the room or those guys down there it's everyone so once they've got past setting up an environment uh, and and possibly some ground rules of what what is up for grabs what's not up for grabs and, and given a bit of structure to where improvement can be i know in some organizations they People put forward all kinds of improvements, which are just aren't appropriate for where the business is in that moment in time. And, and that, that's about perspective again. No, people don't see what the board see and, and vice versa. So th there's a really uh, important thing to, to, to deal with here is obviously you still need to do your day job. That's one thing. So um, determining how much time we can realistically afford on improvement. Um, and it, even, you know, as I, I keep talking about 10 minutes, the right 10 minutes can do a lot of, a lot of good for a business. Um, and I'd, I'd certainly start there. I wouldn't certainly be looking at putting on, um, you know, four hours a day of improvement time because, you know, stopping the day to day for the sake of um, improvement is not always a great answer either if you, you know, damage your cash flow. So it, it really is a job of the senior team to, to work out what is an appropriate amount of time. And, and quite often businesses will say, right, I tell you what, every other week there's a couple of hours there. It's blocked for you guys to work on improvements. Or it might be the you know the every week half an hour on a Friday morning after the team brief they'll they'll go through the improvements and, and spend some time just to nudge it on one step forward. Um, it really determines and what your priority is at the moment in time. For example, if you have got a a, a real problem that's uh, the, the the business level and it requires improvement activity, then putting a little bit more time in does make sense. But the um, the, the risk around these things is that you end up let's say a uh, hundred improvements come out your waste walk. Where do you start? And the risk is that people either spend a time on things that they can't actually affect uh, and are so difficult to improve. They don't actually work on the, the priority system that actually gets the results for the business. So a framework that I often use with companies is what we call the BCS system. And BCS stands for benefit, cost and speed. And so what we simply do is for every improvement opportunity put forward, we give it a score out of 10. And Again, companies need to work out their own scoring system, but crudely, benefit a ten benefit will will really change the world. You know, it'll really make a big difference to the performance of that uh, that working area of the business. Whereas a one would be a very minor improvement that uh, most people probably miss. In terms of cost, 
Um, a 10 would be something that's effectively free, maybe just a little bit of my time this afternoon. And a one might be tens of thousands of pounds of investment that uh, is required to make the change happen. And likewise, in terms of speed, speed, a 10 would be something I can do immediately. I can do it this afternoon. And a one might be something that's got to go three, through three committees and uh, require six months of diligence and sign off to get it to happen. So that means that anything that's going to make a big difference to the performance that I can do for a little bit of my time and nothing much else, and I can do this afternoon, would get to the top of that list. And so what we do with those scores out of 10, we multiply them together to get a score out of 1,000. Um, it's a bit like the risk assessments where you multiply two numbers to get a, a final rating. And so we work from 1,000 down. Anything that's 1,000, we get our teeth into and use our allocated time to work on those things. And then we keep on working our way down the list. And as new ideas get put into the mix, we then score them and then they get um, re-ranked and then we just keep on working from the top down. One thing that's really good with that kind of approach is it can set expectations in the business. So uh, one company I did some work with as a rule of thumb. And again, plan do check out. You put the rule of thumb in place and then you determine what's working for you. They said anything with a BCS score of less than 500 points will not get looked at. And all that sounds quite harsh. What it actually did with the teams was they could say, well, I think my idea is good. But what's the cheaper version or what's the quicker version? And then they could start manipulating the actual idea to get a higher BCS score. So like the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule about getting the biggest bang for your buck, they could re-engineer their improvements so that they could get the bulk of the gain today and worry about the rest of the improvement, the marginal gains at a later date. And that was a really great uh, turning point for that company where they started to realize that just having an improvement idea is great, but having one that's going to have a real impact, that's quick to implement and cost me very little is even better the one that's going to change the world, but take nine months to get there and cost me £200,000. So it's, it's really interesting watching people when they have this bit of time to play an experiment to actually understand how they can play with their ideas to get something even more productive. And, and that goes back to the question. So that, that that's really where the directors and the senior managers can come in is to build that environment where it's safe to fail, where they get some time to work on these things, but striking the right balance between the demands of day-to-day -day operations with the need for growth and uh, evolution. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And and especially you you can't just have all the staff or, or even managers saying, well, it's an old machine. Let's get the new one. That's that's the answer. It's not, not fast enough. It's not better. Um, but there are often, yeah, very small little things that, that can improve the process. Um, that's good. Yeah, I, I've had loads of machines and stuff in the past that have been 100 years old and are still working fine because we look after them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, there's no point of throwing it out just because it's getting old. And and this is a this is a key area that you work in with these sort of uh, process improvement and rules and uh, and sort of formulas and piece that you've you've produced a, a good few sort of books and packs and worksheets that people can uh, get their hands stuck into uh, straight away. Yeah, absolutely. If they head over to the website at uh, smartspeed.co.uk, they can uh, find a whole loads load of resources across their own ideas. Um, in fact, we have a software tool in there called Streamliner, which actually uses the BCS system at the course. You can analyze a process or a business from a whole range of angles and it distills it into one prioritized action list. So, yeah, there's, there's quite a few things across there. All, all, all pretty good accessible prices as well. So uh, uh, it's a good way of uh, getting getting started without having to uh, uh, clear a, a large procurement uh, uh, price. Uh, absolutely that was in the intention we'd rather get these tools out there to people and actually mm -hmm. use them um than having something we sell twice that you know requires 14 signatures on a on a po but um uh, the, the idea is that um they are accessible they, they are used and um people make results happen from these things we we like the testimonials really i should get more commercial on these things but um we did exactly that they can low cost so people actually access these tools no it's great it's great and just just to to end the interview because it's it's been great and I could uh, chat process improvement and and OE the, how we've uh, even implemented it for for our own uh, agency using that um, all day. But um, just a little bit of fun if if you were um, boxed in the corner of of the factory and you want to come out with uh, uh, you got sort of two wishes or two two little uh, things to come out with to to come out with a win uh, for the day. If you you have things that that you always want to take with you or you could. Uh, could magic uh, improve, uh, improve a day's uh, production? <laughs> um, I think there'd be, there'd be two things I'd take then. I would um, 
a pad of paper and a pencil. Because I do believe if you sit there long enough staring at a pad of paper, you can come up with some ideas. And the other one is a a board. You talk about your gamble walks, a board with the improvement actions on there that you can stand with your team. I think if you had those two things, you can pretty much conquer anything. Yeah, I think that's great. The, the sort of visual management and, and being able to to just go through those morning stand-ups quick. Yep, look, the things are going through, safety's up, um, and the, the the plant is moving faster. This, uh, it's a good th- good piece of work. Absolutely. I don't know why people uh, want to avoid having these huddles, but I think it goes back to the point that some managers don't want to have that interaction with the team in fi- case they find more problems or not their already busy day. But if, if anyone's listening and I feel that way, this is a, a great strategy to go forward. Start with a few improvement nibbles. Let people into your world a little bit. Don't feel embarrassed. And then just keep moving forward slowly in the right direction. And it, it can be staggering how far you can move in a short period of time if you do that. Yeah, and it's it's a it's money that's an, an efficiency that's already there. Uh, you've just got to get it. It's mostly it's almost free to to pick up a lot of these improvements and uh, multiplies out on your own orders. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, there are these big capital costs you have to put into a business from time to time, but most of the improvements um, are around those. Um, you know, you might need to get a few tools and a brush here and there to help the uh, the workplace, but usually it's a bit of time just to stop and think and. How people make changes. How about a good example? There was there was um, a team I worked with who were doing a maintenance project. They were working in the uh, uh, the train sector. And they were overhauling um, carriages, which are obviously quite big pieces of kit. And it was taking them six weeks to turn around the maintenance task on on these carriages based on a certain maintenance regime. And we made just a handful of changes. I think the the most we spent was eighty quid on a uh, a trolley to hold some pieces of equipment for them. But everything else was to do with how they organized themselves and their interaction with the other functions of the business, which cost them nothing. And that six weeks came down to four days. It was just the amount of waste inside that process was unbelievable. But as you say, most of it was low hanging fruit. You just get rid of. And, and it just takes a bit of practice to start seeing these things. But that's all people need, a little bit of practice, a little bit of time. And um, it, it's got to be a tough environment if you can't afford a little bit of time just to try and go through that learning process and change. That's but great it's job. really worth it. Well, um, if, now everyone's sort of fired up and are going to go off uh, looking for improvement this afternoon. Um, what's the best way of getting in contact with you or the, the type of businesses you'd like to work with? The easiest way is to head over to the website, smartspeed.co.uk, and uh, drop me a line. Or on there, there's a whole raft of ideas on the blog anyways that people can just take advantage of and, uh, and get on with them. But uh, happy to hear from anyone. That's great. Um, And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening today again to the Cliff Notes podcast, where we asked the leader and found a way. Uh, If you'd like to get in contact with myself or a guest, uh, you can do so at the website cliffnotespodcast.com or on Twitter at cliffnotespod. Uh, We're always great to hear from you and we can pass on the details uh, to Giles. The show notes and everything will be on the site uh, afterwards. And yeah, if you want to like, share and subscribe as always, um, be great to hear from you. Bye bye.